I want to welcome everyone to this talk. Uh, I know a lot of you are in a class uh, this morning, but I also want to welcome uh, everyone who's coming from other classes or from the broader Albuquerque community. Uh, this is a lecture that's part of UNM's Contemporary Jewish Studies <coughs> Lecture Series, which is run under the auspices of the International Studies Institute. Uh, which is a small program, actually small administratively, very large program uh, in terms of student enrollment uh, at UNM. And we are lucky uh, today to have Dr. Arnoff here, uh, who has previously worked uh, for the uh, Humanitarian and Refugee Commission uh, before moving more into academia. Uh, she's currently at Michigan State University. Uh, where she is the Serling and Friends Endowed Chair of Israel Studies, as well as the director of the Jewish Studies program there, which is actually a very large, uh, very impressive uh, program. Uh, she works primarily uh, in, uh, Israeli uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, on Israel's asymmetric wars, and also on Israel's uh, political environment, both domestic and foreign. Uh, and she's published a lot of articles. She's also published some books, of course. Uh, I have one right here, um, which, is, which will be somewhat relevant to, to the talk today, uh, the political psychology of, of Israeli prime ministers, because part of what she's going to talk about is you know, who is going to be the next uh, prime minister, or who will continue as uh, prime minister. Uh, I also wanted to thank a couple uh, people who have helped out with the, the running of this, uh, not just this specific lecture series, but the lecture series uh, in general. We have a, a, an advisory board for the Contemporary Jewish Studies Lecture Committee, uh, I mean, le lecture studies. Uh, that committee is made up of both people at the university and people in the community. Uh, we have uh, Loyola Chastain, who is the administrative assistant for uh, ISI, who helps organize a lot of the details that people don't get to, to see, but which definitely people should appreciate because it's a lot of work. Uh, that's a lot of the, thank, uh, the thankless work. Uh, also, if you haven't noticed, we have our sort of our ISI videographer, uh, Bart Hood in the back. Uh, and I mentioned that in part to thank uh, Bart for doing the work he's doing, but also to let you know that this lecture, along with a lot of the other lectures that we've done in the past, whether they're uh, the contemporary Jewish studies lectures or whether they're you know, other ISI lectures, like our fall lecture series, a lot of these are available on our website. And this one will be available on the website probably in about uh, five days. Uh, so without any further ado, I want to turn it over to Dr. Aronoff to begin her talk presentation. Uh, we, there will be an uh, extended question and answer period at, at the end. So definitely prepare your questions as you listen to her. Okay, well, it's a real pleasure to be, be here with you. It's nice to have some sunshine coming from Michigan as well. And thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's the elections in Israel took place yesterday. So they're not going to have an official uh, thing yet of the tally um, until I think Monday next week. So about 97% of the vote is in and I'll walk you through that. But first I'll give you a little bit of context because I know some of you probably know a little bit more about Israeli history and politics and other uh, probably a little less. So I'll just give a little bit of uh, background before we get started. Uh, so as many of you know, Israel was established in 1948, but even before the state was created, it had already kind of pre-state democratic institutions and political parties. And it has over often 20 political parties that are competing with each other, right, in this parliamentary system, parliamentary democracy that it has unlike our presidential democracy. So even when we analyze the election results from yesterday, we wouldn't expect anyone to get over 50% of the vote. And in all of Israel's uh, history since 1948, no party has ever won and no politician has ever won over 50% of the vote, right? So they don't need that. Like many European uh, parliamentary democracies, 
you might become prime minister with only a quarter of the vote, right? Um, currently, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is prime minister, but most Israelis never voted for him. Even though he's the longest serving prime minister in Israeli history, about a quarter of the population vi uh, voted for him uh, the last few times and also yesterday, right? So it's a very different situation. And part of the reason for that is that when you have so many parties competing with each other, uh, it makes it almost impossible for one party to get uh, most of the vote. Even if you're um, watching the Democratic primary in our country recently, right, when you initially had so many candidates running, it makes it more difficult for any one of them to actually get more than 50% of the vote. Uh, so that's kind of uh, the situation we have there. Now, despite that, for the, about the first 30 years of Israel's um, existence, it was called a uh, one-party dominant political system, so that even though you have a parliamentary system with lots of political parties competing, they really, you know, um, were controlling the pre-state, uh, you know, institutions. Israel started off as a socialist country, and it was uh, controlling a lot of the labor unions and uh, phone companies and other such things in the country, um, and it would win uh, sufficient votes by a plurality to kind of control the go government more or less, but it always needed other political parties in the coalition to get to the 61 uh, seats that it needs, right? So the Israeli parliament has 120 parliament seats, and so in order to be able to form a coalition government, and you always need to form a coalition government, right, because you're competing with so many other parties that you can never get over 50% of the vote, so then the president of Israel, which is more of a ceremonial role for whoever wins the most votes, usually is the one that the president then asks to try to form a coalition, right? To try to form uh, a, a coalition where you would have control at least 61 seats of the 120 seat parliament. Uh, and so the sur really surprising thing this year for the first time in Israel's history is that the party that would win the most votes has been unable to form that coalition. So the first time in Israel's history, we had an election in April, and Netanyahu won the, one, uh, the you know, more votes compared to other parties of the Likud party, but he was unable to form the coalition, right? And so then they had, for the first time, a second set of elections in September, uh, and then the blue and white party, and I'll tell you a little bit about the different parties as well, won the most votes. And neither Netanyahu nor his rival party, a, a relatively new centrist called blue and white party, was unable to form a coalition. And then they called a third set of elections in April. And I have a question mark, right, third time's a charm. Are they able to get it together this time where they'll actually be able to form a coalition? It's actually start, you know, a lot of... Um, constituents of the country are starting to get a little nervous because you can't have a, st uh, a state budget until you have a government. So now like the military is not getting at least 30% of its budget and you have these uh, religious schools that are funded by the government for the religious uh, population or ultra-Orthodox population. They're not getting their money for their schools. So I think the third time around, there are a lot of constituents that are even more eager for the parties to compromise and come up with some kind of coalition because otherwise there's no, you know, there's no budget, there's not as much budget to spend and they would have to move to a four set of elections, uh, which is getting a little crazy, right? So, so why is it that, you know, the elections are so close, and we see in our countries the elections have been pretty close too, but in Israel you have a very polarized society, um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit. I'll go through with you here. These are the unofficial election results um, from yesterday, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about each of the parties. Um, and these are the distribution of votes we think they have. This may, there's still uh, votes from prisoners that need to be counted, from diplomats abroad that need to be counted, uh, from soldiers that need to be counted. And there's, I don't know if now, I should know, there's I think a couple thousand people that have the coronavirus that had to vote separately. Um, and their votes have to be collected in these tents and no one wants to touch the, the ballots of the corona. So their votes have to be counted and hopefully we'll know by Monday. But it's another, again, 
basically from what we can see now is that Netanyahu did a little bit better than he did in September. So I think he got 32 seats in September. Now he has 36. Blue and white had 33. Now it has 32. So they went, each party went up and down a little bit, and I can talk a little bit about that. But as a whole, he still doesn't have enough form of coalition. If you add up the um, parties that he would attract to form a coalition, they add up to 59 seats. So he's two seats short. He still doesn't have it. Um, and so there are lots of possibilities that could happen, and I'll talk you through some of those. Um, before I do that, I want to uh, you know, get back to kind of the polarization in Israeli society and politics. So for the first 30 years, you had this Labor Party dominance. The Labor Party in Israel, um, again, had socialist roots. Um, it wanted kind of security for the country uh, that it highlighted, but it also very much emphasized a socialist agenda at the beginning of the state. It has changed then. It's kind of become more of a social democracy. It has universal health care, but it's more like some of the social democracies in European states in terms of the system that it has, but have mo has moved much more towards capitalism. Um, and the Likud party um, is more, uh, in Israeli uh, uh, terms, the Likud party was seen as more of a right political party, and the uh, Labor Party was seen as more of a left political party. But of course, in different countries, in different political contexts, left and right mean very different things, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean the same exact thing as it would mean in our country, where conservative might mean less government, you know, uh, funding or control for various things, et cetera, et cetera. Or, uh, you know, you might look at what characterized conservative and left in the United States, and it, you couldn't put that exactly onto the Israeli system. But with Israel, the Likud party, I'm talking here, I'm going to step back, and I'm sorry because I know there are people who may be reading about Israeli politics every day in the room and other people that have never done so in their lives, so I'm trying to come up with a medium. And please also tell me if you can't hear me, then I'll use, um, I'm happy to use it, but I'm a loud person, but tell me if you can't hear me and I'll, I'll use the microphone. So in Israel, you have a 20% um, Arab population that are citizens of Israel in the uh, pre-1967 uh, borders. Um, and they have had often their own three or four different political parties. And they join their political parties, and I'll talk to uh, you a little about them, in what's called the joint list. And they have um, 15 seats. Uh, and so they're not a Zionist party. Zionism means that you believe uh, there are different kinds of Zionisms, but most of the parties um, are uh, Zionist parties, which means they believe that there should be a Jewish majority state in the world where Jews have self-determination, essentially. That's the bottom line of what's common to all Zionist parties. And then you have different kinds of Zionism. So the Likud, so sorry if I'm throwing too much out you, at you, and if you, it's something you haven't been exposed to and you have a question, you're confused, don't hesitate um, to ask a question and interrupt me, no problem at all. So the Likud party comes from what's called revisionist Zionism. And so part of their ideology was that yes, there should be a Jewish majority state, but for historical reasons, the borders of that state should be larger, it should be called the greater Israel, and that should encompass what was Israel 2,000 uh, years ago when there was Jewish sovereignty in some of these areas, and therefore should include the West Bank, right? Um, uh, alongside Israel. So they have been, in their platforms, very reluctant to concede uh, parts or most of the West Bank to a Palestinian state alongside Israel, historically and ideologically. Since 2009, Benjamin Netanyahu has said he's for two states, and we can talk a little bit about that. Not everything he does coincides with that, but he at least says he is, and so there have been shifts and there have been different factions in the Likud party, and some people in the Likud party have left and formed centrist parties because they've decided they are for two states. But at least historically, that's one of the things that differentiated the Likud party from the Labor Party in Israel, right? Is where the borders of the country should be, of this uh, Jewish majority state. 
And so they have been the biggest parties historically, but you have lots of other parties. So how are things when we say Israel is a very polarized society and country, how is it polarized? Where are the cleavages? Were there cleavages among um, Arab citizens of Israel and Jewish citizens of Israel? There are cleavages among um, religious citizens of Israel and secular citizens of Israel. So Israel, even though when some people think, oh, it defines itself as a Jewish state, they think of religion and they think, oh, maybe this is a religious country. Maybe it's like Iran defines itself as Islamic country, but that's not the case, right? So e they, when they define themselves as a Jewish state, they define themselves as a Jewish majority state so that they can exercise self-determination, but it has nothing to do with religion per se. They still, uh, most Israelis, on most issues have to have a separation between ch synagogue and state instead of church and state. So that every single prime minister in Israel's history has been secular. So that in America, for instance, America is a much more religious country than is Israel. A lot of Americans go to church every Sunday and every single Israeli pre uh, um, American president often, especially when they're president, if not before, goes to church every single Sunday and goes to church the Monday after the inauguration. It's kind of an American ritual among many other things, right? But in Israel, the prime ministers never go to synagogue. They go maybe once a year. <laughs> They're not particularly religious. And most of the citizens don't go to synagogue every week um, and go maybe a couple times a year, if anything, right? So. Uh, so it's, it's not Jewish state in terms of religion in that sense. So you have cleavages, therefore, among a big chunk of the society that um, identif maybe believes in God, maybe does some of the Jewish holidays, um, but not particularly religious. <laughs> and you have kind of people who are um, much more religious, and they have their own political parties, like some of the, because all you need, the reason you have so many political parties in Israel is that the threshold for support you need to establish a party is one of the lowest in the world. It used to be one of the two lowest world in the world. It used to be at one and a half percent. So all you needed was one and a half people in the country to support you, and you could have your own political party, um, run for office, and have your own seats in parliament. Then they raised it, so I think it's now 3.25 percent, um, but it's still probably one of the six countries in the world with the lowest threshold. So in that way, arguably, there are many flaws to Israeli democracy, but in that way, it's very democratic, right? In the sense that it's open to almost anybody, and anybody, if 3% of people support you, you can have an environmental party, you can have a green party, you can have a religious party, you can have a um, ethnically identified party, you can have a religiously identified parties, and then that's what you get, right? And, and the cleavages are along those lines where, and then you have, um, and then I'm, I'll try to speed up because I'm trying to negotiate kind of current things and giving you the context. But then you also have cleavages between Ashkenazi Jews and Mizrahi or Sephardic Jews. Ashkenazi Jews are Jews who, um, when Jews were there 2,000 years ago and then were expelled by the Romans and then the Babylonians, most of them were dispersed. Some of them stayed there, but most of them were dispersed. Some eventually ended up in Europe and are called Eskenazi Jews and then came back in the 19th century or the 20th century um, to Palestine or to where Israel is. And then you have Mizrahi or Sephardic Jews that often there were a million of them that were living in Iraq and Yemen and Syria and Egypt and Libya. Um, um, and then uh, many of them after the establishment of Israel were either went to, um, uh, came to Israel for ideological reasons or because things were getting worse in the countries they were in or some of them were expelled from those countries and had to leave and came to Israel. But they're called Mizrahi Jews and they spoke Arabic and lived in the Middle East continuously for hundreds of years. So you also have cleavages, ethnic cleavages among them because the Ashkenazi Jews were there first and dominated the institutions and had more power and then the Mizrahi Jews come and that caused tensions in terms of relative power between those groups. So you have lots of cleavages among many of those issues and I'll walk through some of that with you. So when you look at past elections, what you really have is relatively stable blocks that represent different streams of center-left parties and different streams of center-right parties. And you, for the past few elections, you get very close elections where you don't see significant changes 
of people leaving center left to go right or pe people leaving the right to go center left. Rather, they're readjusting kind of within parties in those blocks, right? Um, and you have the sense that on one hand, Israel, the, the Israel, the people in Israel are, are moving towards the right and that the right parties, certainly in the last government, had more relative power than in the past, and that's true. But on the other hand, in terms of the proportion of people that are supporting each blo block has remained relatively the same. So it's these minor little differences, whether you get two seats or lose two seats in that block or gain three seats, that makes a lot of the difference in terms of what the coalition is going to look like. But you don't have a dramatic shift between the two blocks, which is why it stays so polarized and so divided, which also means that you know, it's hard to make any dramatic foreign policy decision when your, co when your country is so polarized and then the coalition becomes constrained. Um, it's hard to make dramatic a change. So for instance, um, towards urgently nego negotiating peace, maybe one of many things that it may be hard to, not impossible, but makes more difficult um, to do. So on one hand, I don't know if you're in international relations class, you learn about the democratic peace, right? Where, you know, most of us international relations scholars have come up with very <coughs> few things we agree on in international relations, really. But one of the few things that many people agree on is that democracies are less likely to fight each other and so forth, right? If they're established democracies with uh, established institutions, etc. But what's interesting to think about, too, is that's true, but is it sometimes harder for democracies to make peace as well? Because are, I'm just throwing that there to be provocative and, and not too provocative, but maybe in discussion, if you want, we can follow it up. But is it easier for an authoritarian regime to make peace? Let's say Egypt and Israel. Egypt was it easier. So that was killed for it, so it wasn't easy. But in 1990, we've had peace between Israel and Egypt since 1979. We've had peace between Israel and Jordan since um, 1994, but the Palestinian Authority was an emerging democracy. They haven't had elections for a while and they have weak institutions because they're not yet an established state, but they have democratic tendencies and, a, and are moving towards a kind of a parliamentary democracy like Israel would have. Israel is a parliamentary democracy and arguably these institutions and polarized divided societies inhibit kind of making dramatic, urgent um, decisions, which maybe for those people who aren't fans of Netanyahu can also be a good thing. Because even if he was able, <laughs> we'll see what coalition he's able to form. But depending on the coalition, he also will have very restrained maneuvering room to, let's say, implement the new Trump peace plan that we can talk about, right, which would rest on perhaps Israel annexing territory unilaterally um, from the West Bank. So that is kind of, um, uh, is a danger depending on the, well, depending on your point of view, but uh, to, 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 I think, establishing a two-state solution, that could be a challenge and a threat to that. Um, but depending on his coalition, he may or may not be able to move there. So arguably, if he was in a unity government, with the blue and white party. And, we, and the blue and white says, oh, we'll never go into government with Netanyahu. Uh, because also, among other things, he has faces three indict, corruption indictments and is supposed to go to trial March 17th. So it's even in some ways, perhaps even more surprising that he got relatively more votes <laughs> than other candidates when he's going to trial on March 17th. Yeah. Uh, would he have uh, immunity under the Israeli system, or does he risk actually going to jail? If well, that's a, yeah, that's a really good point. Up to now, um, uh, he's been able to to stay in power before going to trial. Um, it's unclear. It's not one hundred percent clear. Let's say if he's able to form a government. I think he still has to go to trial on March 17th. So there's two things that, I mean, there's several options that could happen. One option is that, uh, I'll show you the picture, maybe it makes it a little more um, interesting to go there. I probably won't get to all the slides, um, but I'll get to that too. Um, so so Net Gantz is the one on the left, Netanyahu is the one on the right, for those of you who don't uh, follow Israeli politics. 
So Gantz has said, I will not join a government, you know, a compromise unity government in which you rotate who's prime minister. So Israel has had an example in the past where it's so divided that you basically make a deal with another party and one party is prime minister for two years and then the other party rotates and is prime minister for two years and it's called a unity government. Um, and the reason they couldn't form a uni unity government in September is Netanyahu, because he knows he's facing trial for corruption, said, I have to be prime minister first, precisely because of what your professor said, because if I'm pr prime minister first, then I have immunity and I won't, you know, you know, if I lose the trial, won't end up in jail, essentially, right? And Gantz was saying, no, you can't be prime minister first for that exact same reason, and I'm not going to join a government with an in, someone who's indicted, right, for corruption. Um, but it could be, the Gans, uh, you know, if you analyze their speeches yesterday, there's been some articles reflecting on that, say that Gans didn't talk about that in his speech yesterday. So maybe, maybe this time around, in order to avoid a fourth election, he would agree to be in a unity government, Netanyahu, and rotate those things. And then maybe they would make a deal whereby he would let Netanyahu be prime minister first, but only if he doesn't have immunity, if he actually is indicted for corruption, right? So that's kind of one possibility that maybe uh, could happen. Netanyahu is also trying to, because the attorney general was behind indicting him for corruption, wants to either change, if he, if he gets to form a government successfully, one of the things on the agenda will be to change, it, put in a new attorney general who'll be more favorable to him. Um, things sound familiar in this country? No, I shouldn't make any analogies. There are, there are some analogies that could be made. Or, um, uh, or he would try to pass a law in the Knesset that would mean you're immune while you're prime minister from being indicted or, you know, or doing that stuff. So he'd have to pass a law on that. He wasn't able to pass that law this year, which he, <coughs> which he originally wanted to do. Um, yes? In a unity government, what obligations does the second prime minister have to the policies on the table from the first prime minister? Um, that's a good question, and the answer is it depends. Um, so, so, for instance, um, there are certain laws that a new government uh, couldn't just change. They would have to work through the Knesset to amend a prior law <laughs> or to establish a new law, let's say this nation state law that they, they uh, voted for, was it a year or so ago? Um, uh, I, so it depends on the issue area, whether they're beholden or not. But certainly, <laughs> one could argue this, this um, Gantz from the Blue and White Party is a centrist party, uh, and he um, was the former Israel Defense Forces chief of staff, so he was chief of staff of the military. Um, and he is more of a pragmatist. Um, so he's not a leftist in the sense that if you look at kind of the leftmost Zionist party is the Meretz party. Um, they're, you know, very focused very much on human rights. They uh, focus very much on a two-state solution. Um, they're willing to uh, concede uh, a serious amount of concessions uh, to the formation of a Palestinian state, etc. He's kind of in the center. So he's not like Netanyahu that he would like to keep as much as possible. I don't think he's really for the Trump peace plan because the Clinton, every other Israeli um, government before Netanyahu, the three past governments and the Palestinian Authority and uh, both uh, Democratic and Republican recent administrations base their, and I'll talk more about this in the second talk I give today, but base their formula for a two-state solution on the Clinton parameters, where essentially um, uh, the Palestinians would get maybe 92 to 96 percent of the West Bank with land swaps based on the 1967 border. So if they weren't getting 2 percent or 4 percent of the West Bank, they would get it from within the 1967 and border and swap it. So I know it's a little um, complicated uh, if this is the first time you're hearing of it. But basically, the Bush peace plan departs significantly from that. And instead of having um, 
<laughs> Israel uh, keep maybe 2%, 4% of the West Bank where most of the settlers in the West Bank live in three blocks outside of Jerusalem. They would now keep all the settlements across the West Bank, um, have more territory, and keep Israeli presence in part of this bank. Yeah, Eric. Do you mean the Trump plan? The Trump plan. Yeah. Said the Bush. Sorry, 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 the Trump. The reason he came, he came out, um, President Trump came out with this peace plan about three weeks ago now. Um, so basically, you know, some people say he did this as a gift to Netanyahu, right? Because Netanyahu and Trump support each other politically uh, in their own domestic environments. And so he brought Netanyahu to the White House. He also met with Gantz, but he kind of gave much bigger coverage to Netanyahu and thought it might help him a little bit in the election in that, oh, America, the United States supports this better deal in terms of Netanyahu's uh, definition of Israeli interests. But it's something that the Palestinian Authority has not accepted and would never accept because it's a lot worse deal than Prime Minister Olmert, Israeli Prime Minister Olmert offered in 2008 was a much better deal. So they're, you know, they're not interested in this deal. So Gantz is kind of, the problem Gantz faced in this election is that he, he said yes and no to the Trump plan. Like he felt he basically, because things are so divided and he's almost in a life and death competition politically with Netanyahu, he has to, the only way he can get more votes is to appeal to voters in the center right block. So he can't come out saying, oh, it's a hor Trump's plan is horrible and I'm against it because then he wouldn't be able to get center right votes. On the other hand, he also doesn't want to lose center left votes and he therefore said yes but to the Trump plan. The but is that I'm not gonna uh, proceed with this unless I have uh, Jordanian support and other regional support and basically Jordan doesn't support it and would threaten to abrogate its peace agreement even in the worst case scenario with Israel if it went ahead um, with all these plans that the Trump peace plan entails. So in fact, he was saying yes and no simultaneously, and that's one of the reasons perhaps he lost four seats since September, is he had a very, and Netanyahu had a very direct message, and Gantz, in trying to be this pragmatic center that's on one hand trying and needs to get votes, steal votes from the right from him on one hand, but on the other hand doesn't want to you know, lose his base on of the more center left and straddle that ambiguity. But basically I've talked to you know, lots of people and also I, um, I respect Gaithel Omari who I talked recently from the Washington Institute of Nearest Policy who used to work in the Palestinian Authority. And he also says that Gantz would not you know, do any kind of significant unilateral annexations and would oppose that. So even though we don't have a dramatic difference between Gantz and Netanyahu, that one's you know, completely on the left and one's the most right you can get, there is a difference that actually could make a significant difference politically if one, if he gets to be able to form a coalition Netanyahu, the fear is, is he going to start making some unilateral annexations that could really change the environment and, and in the worst case scenario, and the excellent security cooperation between the Palestinian Authority and Israel that's been happening for the past over decade and leaving the door open to trying to find a two-state solution and the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. So you're leaving that door open if you maybe have a unity government with Gantz and Netanyahu, but if you only have a Netanyahu-led government, uh, if, he, if, he, if he succeeds in stealing some people from blue and white, he's actually threatening one blue and white uh, woman who's a Knesset member and saying, I have some secret tape that would be embarrassing to you, and if you don't come over to the Likud, I'm gonna release, I mean, really dirty politics, and that's one reason he's been able to squeak by is he's been playing very dirty in the last couple of weeks. He doctored a video of Gantz and then he had to pay a $2,000 fine for it. But the political advantage for having this doctored video the week before the election, and then you have to pay a $2,000 fine for breaking the rules. So, you know, so what he's gonna hope uh, um, Netanyahu to do is to steal a couple of the votes um, from other parties that they'll leave that party and move and join his to get the 61 seats he needs. If that happens, it's possible that he might be emboldened 
to do some kind of unilateral annexation. If he does a unitary government with Gantz, or if they can't reach that and they have to move to a fourth election, then that leaves the door open for a more pragmatic, less emboldened government that might leave those options open. Please tell me if you have any, because I'm now jumping around a little bit. Um, so I'm trying to see um, what I should quickly get at in, in before wrapping up in the <laughs> next five minutes. One is that Netanyahu kind of opening up the question, if you want to you know, follow this up more in the discussion, why is it that Netanyahu has been able to stay in power so long? Yes, you know, he only has a quarter of the vote. Yes, it's a polarized society. But what happened to the center left in Israel? Why haven't they been able to challenge him more? They, even in 2009, Sipi Livni, who was a woman from the centrist party, by the way, Israel was one of the first countries in the world to have a woman prime minister in the 1970s, Golda Meir. But right now, women aren't fair, aren't doing, you know, aren't continuing to be empowered in the Knesset in terms of their representation. Okay, that's an aside. But in 2009, Sipi Livni, of the, she, she. Um, her main priority in her platform was reaching peace with the Palestinians. She won most of the vote, unable to form a coalition. You still have center parties doing well. Um, you had in 2000, Ehud Barak of the Labor Party, winning by a big majority according to Israeli standards. His first thing on the platform was making peace with the Palestinians within a year and following along Rabin, Yitzhak Rabin's footsteps. Yitzhak Rabin, of course, was the prime minister who um, did the Oslo Accords in 1993 and 1995 with the Palestinian Liberation Organization that established the Palestinian Authority. So here, you know, you have sometimes an Israeli prime minister, not in too distant past, who one on a peace platform, et cetera. So what's happened, right? And so if just very quickly, there are a lot of things that contribute to that. One is that uh, even though on one hand, you could argue that Israeli public has moved a little to the right in terms of now the right being in power most recently. But on the other hand, a lot of the chunks of the right have moved to the center and left the Likud party and established center parties, have started to support a two-state solution. Um, now, even Netanyahu in the, in the past, uh, you know, since 2009, says he's for a two-state solution, etc. So that, in some ways, diminished the difference between the right and left for a lot of the electorate and made it harder. The second thing is because the peace process has stagnated, and because in the 2000 Camp, De uh, Camp David negotiations, which Bill Clinton brokered, and they made a lot of progress in, but Bill Clinton ended up, and Israelis loved Bill Clinton, loved him, adored him. Um, so, you know, he gave the eulogy at Yitzhak Rabin's funeral, and then everybody had a bumper sticker. He ended it with Shalom Chavel, which is goodbye friend at his funeral, and every Israeli bumper sticker had Shalom Chavel. They loved Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton, after the Camp David Accord, said, oh, Barack made these courageous overtures for a peace agreement, and Yasser Arafat um, is to blame for it not happening. I think it's a lot more complicated that, than that, and blame can go around. But nevertheless, the Israeli public, their own prime minister is saying, you know, Arafat failed them. The, Ameri the superpower of the world and their biggest ally is saying it's Arafat's fault. So from the Israeli public's view, the Labor Party's initiatives were rejected. And then you had a centrist party in 2008, Olmert, give a very, very serious proposal. I can tell you the details. And one can understand maybe why Mahmoud Abbas, who I, th I think is a real um, potential partner to peace, um, didn't move forward with it. Um, there are a variety of reasons I could get into for that. But they didn't move forward with it. Um, part of it is that because the Palestinian Authority has democratic elements, Israel's democracy, America has always elections, you have different parties at different times hoping that they can get a slightly better deal with the next American president or the next Israeli leader or with the next <laughs> uh, Palestinian leader. And it's a gamble. And sometimes compared to the Trump plan, it's certainly not a winning battle um, thus far, but that kind of diffused the left, saying, okay, we've well, given these peace initiatives, and you had a very violent period during the Second Intifada. Violence in most countries favors the right rather than the left. Yeah, you have a question. Yeah, so um, would you say that the Israeli political like kind of viewpoint of the general public, does it follow the bell-shaped curve relatively similarly to the way the United States does, or would you say it might be skewed a little bit more to the right? 
You mean how does the right and left divide divide in the U.S. compared to Israel? Uh, yeah. So like like I mean, are you familiar with the model of the bell shaped curve for political opinion? Yeah. Yeah. So like I'm uh, basically what I'm asking is like the United States. If if the United States was to be a baseline of just a you know standard right. bell shaped curve, would you say that the Israeli would be shifted a little bit more to the conservative leaning side, the more right? I. It depends how you define it, right? Yeah. So this is what I'm saying. Because on yeah. one hand, if you just look at the labels of the party, it has sli slightly shifted to the right. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, some of the right party's positions have shifted to the center. Okay, Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it depends on how you look at it. Because um, on one hand, like Lieberman's party, Lieberman is going to make, he's a, he was originally from the former Soviet Union. He had a million Jews coming from the former Soviet Union. <laughs> Uh, to Israel in the 1990s. He has his own, not exclusively, but Russian, Israeli, and ex-Soviet um, uh, citizens who support his party. You know, he's for two states. He has a kind of a problematic, you know, <laughs> version of what two states would look like. So it's not some perfect thing that the Palestinians would accept. But it's, it's, it's definitely moving towards the center from what Likud used to be, right, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So... So it's a great question, but I don't have an easy answer because on one hand, yes, on the other hand, no, depending on how you're viewing the right. Um, I don't really have much time to go into uh, too many of the reasons because um, I want to have a lot of time for discussion. And I, if you want me to get to some of them, I can, um, <coughs> I can during the discussion period. Um, but also, I would say that also the left, of course, has made mistakes. For instance, in 2009, when Tsipi Livni won, she won the most votes. So why couldn't she form a coalition? Well, the Shah's party is an orthodox Mizrahi party. So I told you Mizrahi Jews come f came from the Middle East, right? Um, and they, uh, the leaders, not all the supporters, but the leaders are um, orthodox. And what their primary concern is wanting government money for their own schools and their own health clinics. Um, so in a way, they sometimes say, we'll support whoever gives us most money for what we want, right? And this no negotiation of who can enter a coalition. And she was saying, I'll give you whatever it was, 500 million, but I'm not going to give you the 800 million you want because I feel like it's almost bribery, whatever, et cetera. So she wanted, in her mind, keep her hands clean and not um, bend to their pressure of what they want in order to get into the coalition. But in hindsight, you know, what are, you know, uh, this was 11 years ago. If she had conceded on that, she may may have been able to form a coalition. And her priority was reaching a peace agreement with the Palestinians. So again, you know, um, uh, there are. Uh, politicians who also make mistakes, and, but there are lots of reasons that contribute to it. Um, there's so much to cover, and I want to end it, so I want to um, maybe talk just a little bit about the influence of the Arab parties um, uh, in Israel. So as I said, they represent about 20% of the population, um, and they often have had three to four different parties. Um, he now heads the joint list. They combine the parties who are very different from each other in order to boost their ability to gain more votes. And in this election yesterday, um, they had, I think, one of the highest turnouts. Israel used to have one of the highest voter turnouts in the world. Uh, it used to be sometimes 80%, whatever, of the country. Um, I think it was around 70% in the September election, so it's gone significantly lower from what it used to be, but still much higher than voting rates in the United States. And sometimes the, um, the Palestinian citizenry of Israel, it doesn't only include Palestinians, it also includes Druze, who I can tell you about if you don't know who the Druze are, and Bedouins and others, but it's largely Palestinian nationality who are citizens in Israel, um, that 20%. Um, so they, they, um, they coalesced, oh, they, oh, I was talking about voting rates. So they often voted by maybe 10% less than the Jewish population. But still, if you look at the rates in the last couple elections, they've really shot up. Um, so they used to have about 10, 12 in the Knesset. They shot up to 15. 49% um, uh, voted when they were um, uh, when the Arab parties were 
separated in terms of who you can vote for. Then when they united in the last election, it went up to 59%. Um, and people are saying that maybe we don't know yet that the voting may have been as high as 67%. One reason is they were angry about the Trump peace plan <laughs> because one of the things in the Trump peace plan would be that there would be 350,000 Palestinian citizens of Israel who kind of live on what might be the 67 border that now are put in a new Palestinian state. And even though there are Palestinians by nationality, they don't want to live in the Palestinian state. And it's a variety of reasons why. One is they're like, you know, we live here, why should we move? Another is that right now Israel is a, more, a stronger democracy than is the Palestinian Authority. And of course Hamas runs the Gaza Strip. And the third reason is economically, Israel is now kind of number 17 or 18. It's an OECD country, 7 or eight, 18 on the UN Human Development Index that takes into account income GP, G, uh, GNP, but also health and so forth. Um, so for a variety of reasons, they want to move. So they came out in larger numbers to try to, in a sense, defeat Netanyahu so there wouldn't be a road towards an attempt to kind of go through with that plan. Um, I realize that I, there's so much more I could say and that I prepare for, but I wanted to have time for your questions. So I'll just leave it out there. So I just gave you a little taste of different things and I'll see if there's any of those that you want to follow up on or that you would, um, or if there's a completely different topic that you want to ask <laughs> questions about. Yes. Um, on the last item you mentioned, uh, that, that area is referred to, I think it's the triangle. Right. Uh, I saw an article recently that indicates that many of those people are buying homes and moving to more towards the coast and more right. towards the south. Right. In anticipation. I'm just looking while you're talking if I have a map on this slide or not. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, do, do, do you have that same perspective? Um, that, there, that many of them who can afford to live elsewhere in Israel right. do so. Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, I don't know if many, um, but certainly I've heard that there's some that just in case um, are trying to move from that border area in case there's some kind of swap at that border area. What I was looking for was a map. I'm going to put up my other um, slide here, so I can, which I have a map on, so I can show that to you. you know, for, for those students who are not as familiar with the map of it, right, so you have you know, this is the 67 border from the aftermath of the 1967 war. Um, this is the Gaza Strip. Uh, plans and even the Trump peace plan would entail uh, a connection between the Gaza and the West Bank. But when we talk about um, swaps, you know, basically even the Arab League, the Saudi peace plan from 2001 and the Arab League has voted um, since 2013 that an eventual peace plan would be based on the 1967 border with swap. So it used to be, no, we have to return to the 67 border. And six, uh, since 2013, and also the Palestinian Authority said, no, because Israel has so many settlers living right outside uh, Jerusalem here in blocks, like they're like towns with 80,000, 60,000 people in them, they're saying, Israel, okay, you could keep that 2% but then you'd give us 2% of maybe territory near Gaza or the territory between the two. You'd compensate us with an equivalent amount of territory that you're keeping outside of the 67 border. So what the Trump peace plan entails is that rather than um, Israel and the Palestinian Authority negotiating which pre-1967 border would be swapped, which you know, I think at the end of the day it would have to be negotiated for both parties to agree to it. It would entail, it suggests, oh, why don't we swap some of the territory that actually has 350,000 Palestinian citizens of Israel to it to the new Palestinian state in the West Bank. And most of those people don't want to do that, which is why it's problematic, right? And probably, I, my guess is, would not happen but that really kind of riled up, uh, understandably, their fears for why they came out in higher numbers yesterday. Yes? Okay, so is that, is that map before or after the six days war? This, it, th this has the lines of the 67 war, those, um, what do you call it, disconnected lines is the line of the 67. And what's on the right hat is the West Bank, and what's on the left near Egypt is the Gaza Strip. So 
this yeah. is the worst. Yes, the yes. So six days work, right? If I understand, every 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 neighboring country just went in and went at Israel. Right. Um, Israel defended itself and, and pushed back lines. According to like UN policy, that's if you capture territory while defending yourself, that's your territory now. What is the like? What's the what's the other argument? What's the other okay. side? So that's a good question, um, and that's what um, you know. Uh, so some people, um, uh, like Netan probably even Netanyahu now, calls it kind of disputed territory, not occupied territory. For that reason, the, the A, you know, Netanyahu's party is like, well, it's not occupied because it's indigenous to us. Like the biblical cities of Judaism are there, the graves of the Jewish forefathers are there, there used to be Jewish sovereignty there, therefore how could you occupy territory that you yourself are indigenous to, right? That's, so I'm presenting both arguments. Um, the second argument is what you say, well historically every single country in the, every single country's borders in the world and every, almost every state in the world is a product of war, right? Charles Tilley's book on how states are made and therefore you know, historically, all, at different times, all states' borders have been disputed. And historically, right, you guys are doing realism and liberalism, one student said in your international relations class, under the realist paradigm in international relations, it's exactly what you say, the stronger win, right? If you're stronger and win a war, tough luck, you get the territory because you won, right? Historically, and from a realist paradigm, that has worked. But, right, we're, you know, arguably no longer in that paradigm where the international community accepts that anymore through the United Nations and so forth. So most legal scholars, I think, and international lawyers will now argue, there's some that might state the position that you put out that it's disputed territory it's not, or it's not occupied territory. But I think most international scholars and most countries today will say, no, it's occupied territory and it's supposed to go to an eventual Palestinian state. And therefore, in a eventual peace agreement, Israel will have to withdraw from the vast majority of it for it to become a viable state. So I would say that, that you know, you could argue legally one case or another, but politically, and then that's what I'm going to get to also in my second lecture today in terms of where the legitimacy of two states lies, I think both legally and normatively, we're living in a world where there's an international right to self-determination. And it, you, I think, you know, student, I love when students agree, disagree or debate, so you're welcome to disagree, but I'd put out the position that you're, you're hard put as a Palestinian to argue for self-determination for Palestinians, but reject it for Jews. And you're hard put as a, uh, uh, as a Jewish Israeli or a Jewish diaspora member or observer, you know, to the conflict, who's not party to either, to say there's self-determination, there should be self-determination for Jews in Israel, but no self-determination for Palestinians. You either have a right, as a people, you either have a right to self-determination or you don't, right? So you have that legal norm as well that's very entrenched. And you have the reality now, the political reality that the um, Palestine Authority is, um, is desire or right for self-determination is recognized by most states in the world, right? So you could nitpick legally whether it's disputed territory or occupied territory, but most legal scholars would argue that it's occupied and politically that's where uh, we are now. So even some of Israeli, uh, Israeli prime ministers like Ariel Sharon who came from and helped found the Likud party when he withdrew from all soldiers and settlers from the Gaza Strip uh, in the summer of 2005 and intended to unilaterally withdraw from most of the West Bank before he got a debilitating stroke, he started calling it occupied territory, right? Uh, which was a huge shift. Right. So yeah. if the Six Days War went the other way, yes. it, would be, it would be reversed political circumstances today. Right, I don't know. The UN would be, the UN would be chastising um, Arab countries that, that got... Maybe. The UN is not only a moral institution, but also a political institution, right? So it depends if most states are for something, it could be the right thing, or it could not necessarily be the right thing. It depends the political... <laughs> I know um, there are some, like, Israeli military people who think that if they lost the 67 war, Israel maybe could have continued to exist. 
there are a lot of people at the time who were building mass graves and putting like um, ta tags with the, their children's names and babies' names on it because they thought that there would be massacres if they lost and Israel would be destroyed if they lost the 67 war. So it's a very interesting idea what would have happened had Israel lost the 67 war. And another interesting thing to think about, by the way, in terms of projecting since, what are the repercussions? And you could think of it two ways too. On one hand, would Israel have been a lot better off had it in 67 not occupied the West Bank, right? Then, then you wouldn't have an occupation of the West Bank. You wouldn't, you know, you, we would be in very different circumstances, et cetera, which may be for the better, right? If it hadn't done so, it kind of didn't make a political decision to, it kind of um, went in there chasing Jordanian troops and then offered it to Jordan afterwards for peace and Jordan rejected it, a whole different story. But on the other hand, had it not occupied some of the territory in 67, it wouldn't have had a land for peace formula, which enabled the Egyptian peace agreement to happen that it had the Sinai that now would give back for peace, that it had, you know what I'm saying? So we don't know, there are counterfactuals. What would, I mean, you could look at it the other way. If it had gone to war but not occupied the West Bank, where would we be today? It's a kind of an interesting hypothetical to think about, yeah. Can you identify a situation since, the, um, since 1945 similar to this where there was a, a dispute or a war and one country occupied another? Yeah, I mean, there are lots. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, the way, you know, again, the way international ways is there's lots and lots of occupations and there are lots of continuing occupations today, right? You could argue Russia and Chechnya, China and Tibet, um, Morocco and Western Sahara. I mean, the list can go on and on and on, right? Turkey and Northern Cyprus, um, uh, the Kurds and several different countries in the Middle East, right? Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, is the, if the UN and international law says currently, that occupation, that there's there occupation and not you get to, to own the territory you invade. Well, that, yeah, that's, you're saying, why, what, is there a double standard or is there, why? I'm not saying what, yeah. there's a double standard. I mean, if either international law says that um, nowadays we don't recognize uh, <laughs> Uh, colonialism, or, right? Uh, taking over a, another country's land. If that's if that is the current state of mm -hmm. international law, then what does the UN or what does? I mean, we all focus on what happens in Israel. It's very black and white to many people, and all the attention is put there. What about these other places? And yeah, it's a very, I mean, you're looking at decision making, you're looking at states. There's a lot of inconsistency, right, in any country's foreign policy. And there's a lot of inconsistency internationally in terms of what the norms are and which norms are implemented and enforced, right? Um, and also the veto powers in the UN and Palestine and R Some states are more important. Than exactly. Um, so, so basically, again, from the realist paradigm in international relations, right? If you have the power, both militarily and politically, maybe as part of the UN Security Council, if you're China or Russia, both China and Russia occupy lands, right? Um, the UN accused. China of genocide against Tibet in the 1950s, and won't Israel is discussing independence, you know, in serious negotiations for a Palestinian state. China wouldn't even negotiate with the Dalai Lama autonomy, much less independence, right? Uh, and settled the, uh, Tibet, etc. But it has the power to say, yeah, you know, too bad. <laughs> this is ours and we think it's ours and who are you to tell us otherwise and we'll make it ours through settlements. Just like Turkey is making northern Cyprus ours through settlements and it's a pretty common occurrence for a country to then say well if demographics makes a difference we'll settle more of our people in this area, change the demographics and that will give us more of a claim to it, right? And so that's what China gave financial incentives for Han Chinese to move to Tibet, but it has the power politically and militarily, you know, which 
so you, so there is an inconsistent implementation of things, but Israel is a you know it's still a relatively small country in the Middle East, and politically it doesn't have the influence of a China or Russia to say too bad if we're defying a norm, right? Um, uh, so, and and I, I I won't get into the colonialism question because I wouldn't actually put it in a colonialist category, which a lot of people do. <laughs> um, so I don't think it's exactly colonialism that's going on in the West Bank. But in, yeah, both of you. First, you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I just want to know uh, real quick. I yeah. Okay, that's a great question. She, uh, so, uh, what's your name? Alyssa. So Alyssa asked, what did um, uh, the U.S. or Trump's moving of the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, was it about a year ago? I forget. What, what, what impact did that have, you know, politically and so forth? So on one hand, again, the impact it had in terms of election, Israeli elections, which we're also talking about today, is that arguably one of the reasons that, well, I think the main reason Trump did it was his, uh, d his own domestic politics and the 30 million or so evangelical Christians who support him. It's much more than the 2% of Jewish Americans are the 30 million uh, Christian evangelicals who supported that move. And so many of the moves he's made arguably, I don't know, are also primarily for his own domestic political interests. But it's also maybe arguably to kind of um, strengthen Netanyahu politically within Israel to say, because most Israelis um, supported moving the embassy, no matter what party they vote for, not all, but most. Why? And so what is the significance of that? Well, the embassy was moved to Western Jerusalem. Western Jerusalem is within the 1967 borders. So for most people around the world, they recognize the legal right of Israel to have its government offices within the 1967 borders in Western Jerusalem. That's why Israel has its, has its Supreme Court. That's why it has its Knesset or Parliament. That's why it has its prime ministers and presidents houses. It's a mostly uh, Jewish and which within the 1967 borders that the vast majority of countries around the world respect as being Israel's, you know, borders, right? Or ex internationally recognized borders. So therefore, and I don't know, for, I don't know, 30 years, different American governments have said, we will move the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem because no one disputes the fact that you can have government offices and that we, therefore we can... Uh, respect that the capital is in West Jerusalem. But the reason it was never implemented is because East Jerusalem is disputed, right? So East Jerusalem is part of the city where you have a significant population, uh, Palestinian population. And you have, uh, for many of you when, you, when you think of Jerusalem, you probably think of the old city of Jerusalem, which is one kilometer within um, the walled city where you have a lot of the most significant religious sites, right? Where you have the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where you have the, um, for um, Jews, the number one religious site, the remnants of the old uh, temple or the Western or Wailing Wall, and where you have two mosques, a beautiful mosque with the Golden Dome, which is the third holiest site for Muslims, etc. right? So you have a lot of significant uh, religious sites for the three monotheistic religions in East Jerusalem. Right? So that's what's disputed. So the reason it was controversial is because even though there's nothing wrong with putting, and in theory there's nothing wrong with putting an embassy in West Jerusalem, is it somehow going to be interpreted as, or is it somehow sending a signal out that East Jerusalem, that all of Jerusalem will be permanently Israel's and that it won't concede parts of East Jerusalem in an eventual peace agreement. So that was the controversy. And therefore, and Trump said something like, well, you know, he said an ambiguous thing. Like he has one, th I think in one hand was saying Jerusalem is Israel's, you know, kind of indicating also East Jerusalem. On the other hand saying, well, you know, some of the borders will have to be negotiated. But he got a lot of criticism from um, this, well, not a lot, but some criticism from the southern left parties in Israel would have preferred if it had been done 
during a process of serious peace negotiations with the Palestinian Authority or as a product of a peace agreement, because then it's kind of clear that Israel is getting something it wants, like the embassy in West Jerusalem, but then the Palestinians are getting something they want, which is to have Jerusalem or Al-Quds be their capital, which would entail most of East Jerusalem. And so if it did it as well, you're both going to get something out of it. It may have induced trust by both parties, but by only giving it to Israel without that, it um, allowed the Palestinians' distrust of the Trump administration to grow to the fact where they won't have anything to do with anything Trump suggests in terms of them. So they immediately, even before the, his peace plan was announced, rejected it because they already lost trust um, in the Trump administration. So again, now it's interesting in the Democratic campaign, there's been a couple of questions in the primary. If you became president, would you... Yeah, I don't think the now that the embassy is in West Jerusalem, uh, so, so I think, I forget now whether Sanders said, well, maybe I would move it, and um, more, I forget whether she, you know, they were kind of ambiguous things. I think it's very unlikely now that it's in West Jerusalem that any American president would move it. You could have very different policies towards Israel depending on who the next president is. But I doubt that it would be moved simply because it's within the 1967 borders in West Jerusalem. So in that sense, it wasn't done in the most constructive way in terms of moving things towards peace. But in itself, without that political context, there's nothing wrong with it, right? So it probably won't be moved. Uh, was there, yeah, you had a question, and then you, yeah. So if Benny and Netanyahu managed to form a unity government, do right. you think the progress of Israeli settlements in the West Bank would increase, or do you think it would decrease? If they formed a unity government. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Of course, political scientists are much better at understanding what happened in the past than predicting what's going to happen in the future, so I'm always on an unsound ground when I'm making predictions for the future. But I do think if Gantz was in the government, he would be a big break, you know, kind of to Netanyahu and, uh, and other parties wanting to go ahead with that. Um, so I would expect either no unilateral annexations if under a unity government or very small, less controversial ones. Given my own politics, I hope I'm right. I shouldn't necessarily put my own politics into it. But being someone who'd like to see a two-state peace agreement, I think that you know, any significant unilateral annexations would harm that. Um, so, but I think that you could see a scenario where you have none or, <coughs> or very, you know, much less than it would have been if it's just Netanyahu with, outside the United States government able to get those two extra seats he wants in the next few weeks. Then he, there'll be kind of a big temptation because the Trump administration may say, go ahead and we're, you know, we support you. And that makes it harder almost for him not to do it when, uh, when that's the case. So, so that could really change things significantly if that were to happen. Yeah. Yes. So I'm part of a pro-Israeli organization on campus. Uh -huh. It's called Christian United for Israel. And so just recently in one of my classes, I got in trouble for saying that Israel is the only true democracy in the Middle East and that Hamas was um, committing terror against innocent Israeli civilians. And as you know, there's a lot of anti-Israel, anti-Israeli bias on college campuses across the country. And so my question to you is, what advice do you have for pro-Israeli students? I'll, I'll restate the question, um, yeah. What advice do you have for pro-Israeli students when it comes to defending Israel on Okay, that's a great question. I'll restate the question because you're not as loud as I am. Right, what's your name? Kira. Kira. She says she's in a pro-Israel um, organization on campus that's uh, Christians for, uh, for Israel and that she was in a class recently where uh, people criticized her or challenged her for saying that Israel is the only true democracy in the Middle East and for saying that Hamas uses terror tactics. Is that, did I capture what you said correctly? Okay. So. Before I um, you know, respond to that question, I would like to say that often, you know, I was talking about polarization within Israel. Um, in the United States, we're becoming increasingly, increasingly polarized. And so, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can be very polarizing, right? So the first thing I'd like to say is, 
being pro-Israel and pro-Palestine are not mutually contradictory and not mutually uh, conclusive. What I love to assign, if you ever get a chance to read, what I love to assign is um, a chapter called Between Right and Right uh, by Amos Oz. He, um, he passed away a year or two ago, but he's one of Israel's three most famous novelists, and he also was a peace activist his whole life. And he wrote this chapter called Between Right and Right. And he, he basically writes the chapter as if he's writing to a European audience, but it could be an American audience, an American university, uh, in that sense. And he says, like, when you, you look at this conflict, you're almost like watching it like it's some kind of cowboy movie. And like you're watching a movie and you're trying to say, who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Let me support the good guy against the bad guy. And he says the tragedy of this conflict, and I happen to agree with him, which is why I signed this chapter as well, is that the tragedy is you have two nations that are both right. Right? They both deserve self-determination. They both have legitimate nationalist movements. They both deserve um, to have a state and to live in peace together, right? So in that sense, and he ends it, you can be pro-Israel, pro-Palestine, and pro-peace, and I honestly believe that, right? And one way you can do that is if you're for Tuesday solution, then you support Israel, you support the South and Palestinian state, and you support peace between them. So it's not as if you have to, you know, be pro-Israel and demonize the Palestinians. And it's not as if you have to be pro-Palestine and then inherently, because there's a good guy and a bad guy, demonize Israel, right? As we're seeing with Israeli politics today, you have a lot of diverse opinions and a lot of diverse uh, communities within Israel and within Palestine. And you don't want to treat them monolithically and you don't want to demonize them. So now let me get to your question, right? Because I reject the choice that you have to be either pro-Israel or pro-Palestine or pro-peace. But let me get, so is it the only true democracy in the Middle East? It certainly is the most, the only continuous democracy in the modern Middle East, right? I think that's an objective fact, right? In Turkey, you had, it was a democracy, but you had military coups. In Israel, you've never had a military coup. In Lebanon, you had a democracy, but then you had a civil war, and it became lots of challenges to that democracy, and one, and Hezbollah has military arms that it used to coerce also people's elections. It has its own military, right? So there are democratic elements in Lebanon, and it, it, it was democracy, it has democratic elements now. Turkey certainly has, um, you could argue, arguably say a democracy now, but because it jails more journalists, I think, than any other country in the world, there's certainly a weakening <laughs> democracy if it's still a democracy. You could argue in Israel that democracy is being challenged and weakened um, through challenging the checks and balances of the high court, but the high court in Israel is still very strong. Um, in Israel. So you do have um, attempts at democracy in Lebanon and Turkey um, and in the Palestinian Authority. Um, but I think one could be on safe ground by saying, yes, indeed, it is the only continuous democracy. Now, people can argue with that and debate that, but I, I would support that statement. And hopefully in classrooms, you can agree to disagree respectfully, right? And that's the thing when you're dealing with an emotional issue is that you can agree or disagree what type of democracy Israel is or what type of democracy Turkey is, but you do it respectfully and then back up your arguments. And then secondly, in terms of terror tactics on the part of Hamas, um, certainly the United States recognizes Hamas as an organization that uses terror tactics. Terror tactics are that sometimes you intentionally target um, civilians. Certainly states can use terror tactics. Non-state actors can use terror tactics. Um, but there, I think there is validity. You can agree or disagree with Hamas's ends, right? You can have legitimate ends and not agree with the means. So what I like to do is try to get you all to not argue about the ends, because you may support or not support the ends of any particular state or non-state actor, but see if you can come consensus, because that's why I'm writing a book now on the dilemmas of asymmetric wars, and I teach a senior seminar on dilemmas of asymmetric wars, because I think this is a really important question, is a means of war question, and what do you do in these kinds of wars in terms of means of war? And there are no easy answers, but in terms of legal norms, I think one would, and most UN members, try to enforce a norm 
that neither states nor non-states should intentionally target non-combatants or civilians. And if you do, then you could be on safe ground, I think, for calling it a uh, tactic that, uh, that, in that intentionally <coughs> focuses on combatants, and therefore that's called a terror tactic. Again, you dis could disagree on ends. You can dis disagree on who uses this tactic and how widely they use this act. They're also a hybrid organization that targets soldiers, which is not terrorism. So uh, both Hezbollah and Hamas are hybrid organizations that, use that, um, that uh, go after civilians, but they also go after soldiers, right? So, so I think these are all really complex issues. I, th I feel my heart goes out to people no matter where they stand, if they feel like they're being attacked uh, or disrespected or talked to in a disrespectful way, which I don't think should happen. Um, but bringing it back you know, and, and looking at it uh, kind of in terms of are there norms that can be agreed on apart from ends, right? And apart from who's doing it and arguing who's doing it is, you know, is this state doing it? Is that non-state arguing? If you at least come to agreement on whether we should have norms and there's value to have norms in fighting war because any war is hell but it's even more of a hell if you don't try to abide by some international norms regarding that. Well, I'm happy to stay after if our time's up and, and answer any other questions. So I, I would